This Sunday, revenge politics. Former President Trump sets off alarms about what his return to the White House could look like. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Plus, abortion fight. The Texas Supreme Court temporarily blocks a pregnant woman from an emergency abortion. There's no outcome here that I take home my healthy baby girl, you know, so it's hard. Will the state force her to continue her pregnancy? And new charges. President Biden's son Hunter is indicted for the second time this year. Nine new criminal counts, including tax evasion and filing false returns. What will be the political impact? Plus, under fire, the presidents of three elite universities facing backlash after their testimony at a congressional hearing on anti-Semitism. And now the president of the University of Pennsylvania has resigned. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Penn's rules or code of conduct? Yes or no? If the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment. Yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? The answer is yes. My guest this morning, Republican Senator Mitt Romney of Utah and Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut. Joining me for insight and analysis are NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, Jonathan Martin of Politico, Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher, and Lonnie Chen, a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Welcome to Sunday, it's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Kristen Welker. Good Sunday morning. In many ways, this week has felt like an inflection point, with Israel's war against Hamas intensifying and claiming more lives. And tensions boiling over here at home about how to address hate speech. Adding to the mix, with less than a week to go before lawmakers leave Washington, there is still no deal on Israel and Ukraine aid. NBC News has learned that the White House is expecting to ramp up its outreach to Capitol Hill this week. But a senior administration official is making it clear the engagement will depend on having a clear framework on border negotiations to work from. And that hasn't happened yet. Earlier this week, President Biden signaled he is ready to make a deal. I am willing to make significant compromises on the border. We need to fix the broken border system. It is broken. In a new Wall Street Journal poll, just 27 percent approve of the president's handling of securing the border, 64 percent disapprove. NBC News has also learned a number of Hispanic and Latino members of Congress, as well as advocacy groups, are becoming increasingly concerned that President Biden may strike a deal with Republicans on immigration that they find unacceptable in order to secure passage of his Ukraine and Israel package. The fear, according to one Capitol Hill Democrat, the president will accept border policy changes proposed by Republicans that are, quote, unimaginably cruel. Now, looming over all of it, the 2024 race for the White House and new controversial comments by former President Donald Trump. In a Fox News interview this week, he was pressed several times to say categorically that he would not abuse his presidential power if elected to a second term. Mr. Trump declined to give a denial. You are promising America tonight. You would never abuse power as retribution against anybody. Except for day one. Yeah. Except Look, what? He's going crazy. Except for day one. Meaning? I want to close the border and I want to drill. That's drill, not a that's, drill. That's not, oh, no. that's not retribution. I got I'm it. gonna be I'm gonna be, you know, he keeps <laughs> we love this guy. He says, You're not gonna be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than day one. And joining me now is Republican Senator Mitt Romney of Utah. Romney, of course, was the Republican nominee for president in 2012. Senator Romney, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thank you for being here. Happy to join you, Kristen. A lot of headlines to get to, but let's start with that Texas abortion case. The state Supreme Court, as you know, put a hold on a lower court's decision to allow Kate Cox to have what her doctors say would be a medically necessary and potentially life-saving abortion. Now... Her fetus has been diagnosed with a fatal condition, and if she carries it to term, doctors say it could jeopardize her ability to have more children in the future, something that she says she very much wants. What is your reaction, and should Kate Cox have the ability to terminate her pregnancy? 
Well, I'm not going to stand in for the courts. Uh, they're going to evaluate the evidence. Uh, I am pro-life, but people like me who, that are pro-life also believe that when a woman's life is in danger, the opportunity for an abortion should be apparent for her. So we'll see what the court ultimately gets to. But recognize, after the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade and the decision went back to the elected officials in the various states, uh, there are a lot of parameters and nuances that haven't been sorted through yet. That's going to happen in Texas and other places, and ultimately we're going to find a settled uh, understanding. And as you're indicating, you did support overturning Roe v. Wade, but was this what you imagined when you supported Roe v. Wade being overturned, that a woman who'd been told by her doctors that she needs an abortion potentially to save her own life would be denied one? Well, I think the question here will be whether or not, in fact, her life is at risk. And if it is at risk, then I think under Texas law, although I'm not an expert in Texas law, under Texas law, she'll be allowed to have an abortion. But each state's going to have to make this decision. And, and I, you know, stepping back, I think you have to recognize when you have an issue that the nation is divided on, where, particularly when it's a moral issue, when some people feel it's a moral wrong to have an abortion and other feels, feels that it should be a, a moral right for a woman to be able to choose, in a setting like that, you don't want to have a, a small group decide to impose their will on everybody else. There's got to be some kind of meeting towards the middle. That hasn't happened yet. I hope that does happen in Texas and in every other state. And ultimately, that's the way America works. We, we can't have people pulling each other apart and insisting that they have to have 100% of they, what they want and the other side gets nothing of what they want. Well, and speaking of that, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who is fighting the lower court's decision, is threatening criminal prosecution for anyone who helps Kate Cox get an abortion, including her doctors. Does that go too far? Do you think that her doctor should be punished if the court rules that she is entitled to this abortion? Well, certainly in Texas, as in every other state, they're going to follow the law. Uh, but I think in many cases, politicians play to their base, pay, uh, play to the crowd. Uh, in this case, let's let the courts adjudicate what the parameters are going to be of, of abortion in Texas and elsewhere. And ultimately, this has got to be settled, not by one side, again, imposing its will on everybody else, but both sides working together where each gets something. And that hasn't happened yet. OK, let's turn to those comments that we just played by former President Donald Trump. As you heard, he said he would not be a dictator except for day one. At an event in New York last night, he tried to downplay that. But what was your reaction to hearing those words, Senator? Do you believe him? You know, when I was a uh, kid, there was something called a gumball machine. You could put a penny in and a gumball would come out. It was automatic. There was no filter. Put in the penny, out came the gumball. Donald Trump is kind of a human gumball machine, which is a thought or a notion comes in and it comes out of his mouth. There's not a lot of filter that goes on. There's not a lot of what's the implication. No, he just says whatever. I don't attach an enormous amount of impact to the particular words that come out and try and evaluate each one of them. I do think you can look at his record as president and particularly in the last months of his presidency and say, this is a dangerous approach. It's an authoritarian approach. That gives me far more concern than, than him uh, playing to the crowd as he did. Well, given that you're saying he gives these unfiltered responses, we have actually seen him do what he says he's going to do when he said that he believed the election was, the election was going to be rigged before people actually went to the polls. He went on to question the results, tried to overturn the results of the 2020 election. Why don't you take him exactly at his word? Oh, I, I think we agree that we have looked at his behavior, and his behavior suggests that this is a person who will impose his will, if he can, uh, on the judicial system, on the legislative branch, and on the entire nation. I mean, when he called people to come to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, that was not a random date. That was the date when peaceful transfer of power was to occur. He called that on purpose. I mean, he, there's no question he has authoritarian rulings and, and interests and no, notions which he will try and impose. That's dangerous for the country. It was dangerous then. Life was lost. Uh, we were embarrassed around the world. I mean, it, it, this was a tragedy. And a number of the things he did in the last months of his uh, presidency suggest what he'd do if he were elected again. I want to drill down on you on just how dangerous, as you say, you perceive former President Trump to be. Liz Cheney 
put this into dire terms this week. She told my colleague Savannah Guthrie, quote, there's no question Trump would refuse to leave office if he's reelected. She went so far as to say a vote for him may mean the last election that you ever get to vote in. Do you agree with that assessment? I don't think Donald Trump would want to stay in longer than four years. And the reason I say that is because I, th I think he's running for retribution, and I think he will have finished his retribution after four years if he's elected. Uh, I don't think he particularly likes being around the White House. I think he'd rather uh, be back at Mar-a-Lago or other properties of his. Uh, but he wants to show that he's not a loser. He won, uh, and he wants to go after the people who were tough on him. So I, I think he'll be finished after four years and go back to uh, uh, other occupations. Given everything that we have heard from former President Trump, what do you think a second Trump term would look like? Well, I think if you can look at the last few months of his presidency, you'd suggest that that's the kind of thing you might see, uh, that he would not have the generals around him, as he did last time, people of judgment and experience offering advice, and in some cases, restraining his impulses. Instead, he would have people around him encouraging his impulses and perhaps adding to them. Uh, and I'm afraid you'd, you'd find the nation more divided. Look, look our, our nation doesn't need to be divided right now. A, a campaign based on anger and hate uh, may win at the ballot box temporarily, but it tears the country apart. The other day, the president, former president said that, that we are at greater threat for what, what is within. I, I think that was in some respects a self-own because what's within, if he were to become elected president again, is a campaign of retribution and anger and hate. That's not what America is based on. America was based on the idea of in God we trust and united we stand divided we fall. Divided nation is not the nation America is intended to be. All right, well, let's move on to Hunter Biden and the headlines around that. As you know, he was indicted on nine new tax charges this week, the second time he has been indicted by the special counsel this year alone. His lawyer said that if his name was anything other than Biden, the charges would not have been brought. What's your reaction to that? Well, if his name were anything other than Biden, he wouldn't have been able to bilk millions of dollars from foreign entities. So let's start there. And not only did he take all this money from foreign entities, trading on his father's name, which is uh, ugly and, and unsavory, uh, he then didn't pay taxes on it, according to the prosecutors. We'll see if they can prove that case. But if they can, uh, he violated U.S. law and should be severely punished for having done so. As you know, House Republicans have signaled that they may vote as early as this week on an impeachment inquiry into President Biden, despite the fact that they haven't shown yet a direct link between Hunter Biden's business dealings and President Biden. Have you seen any evidence that President Biden has committed high crimes and misdemeanors? No, I, I, I don't uh, see any evidence of that at all. Uh, I think before you begin an impeachment inquiry, you ought to have some evidence, some inclination uh, that there's been wrongdoing. And so far, there's nothing of that nature that's been provided. So are you opposed to the impeachment inquiry? Well, if I were in the House, I'd vote against it, unless they were able to bring forward uh, uh, evidence that suggests that there, there were a high crime or misdemeanor that had been uh, committed. But so far, that hasn't been the case. Look, look fortunately uh, for most people, we're not responsible for the misdeeds of our kids and grandkids and great-grandkids. Nothing in my family I'm embarrassed about. But, but uh, President Trump's, excuse me, President Biden's son, Hunter, is mm. obviously been a very unsavory person and has had some extremely uh, damaging personal uh, uh, foibles, including a drug habit and so forth. Uh, that's not President Biden, and, uh, and we're not going to impeach someone because of the sins of their kids. Okay. Let's talk about that aid package on the Hill, which is under a lot of debate, as you know. The Senate has one week left to negotiate this aid package for Israel and Ukraine. Republicans are holding a hard line on border security. What are the implications of not passing aid to Ukraine right now, Senator? Well, I, I don't know specifically how quickly the money has to get to Ukraine, the armament has to get to Ukraine, whether we could wait until January. But I, I can say just a couple of things. Uh, one is, it's not just Republicans that are holding a hard line. It's Democrats are holding a hard line. Either side can move and, and can get this done. And, and here's the position of my side and our side. And that is, we have gone from one to 2,000 encounters, illegal encounters at the border a day, under the, uh, the three prior presidents, under Bush, Obama, and Trump, one to 2,000 a day. Now we're seeing 10 to 12,000 a day. 
as Pennsylvania Senator uh, John Fetterman said, we're basically seeing Pittsburgh show up at the border every month, all right? We're at a rate of incursions into the country of about 4 million a year. Mm -hmm. that, that's larger than the population of 24 of our states. So we want to solve that to secure the border. I just saw the President of the United States say that, that we've got to secure the border. Yeah. He's right. So any effort that doesn't do that will be rejected by Republicans. We want to get it back to the level that existed under the three prior presidents. And, and I guess, and you're right, I know that this is a priority for Republicans. And you're right, President Biden has said he's willing to negotiate. It was described to me, you have to get through all of the disagreement around the border to even start addressing the Ukraine and Israel piece of it. Taking a step back, what message do you think it sends to President Putin, to President Xi, when they see that there are a growing number of Republicans who are opposed to writing what they say is a blank check to Ukraine? Well, we're not going to write a blank check. We're going to evaluate exactly how the money is spent. What we're going to do is provide Ukraine with the weapons they need to defend themselves against a brutal invasion by Putin, who is a thug and a murderer. So that, that's what we're going to do. Now, I think they realize, I think Putin and Xi recognize that democracy is messy, mm. that our system is not authoritarian. We don't have a king. We don't have a dictator. They're dictators. They like to make a big deal out of the process that we go through. But you know what? It has worked for America in the past. It'll work in the future. We'll get through this. And ultimately, don't forget, the president was the one that put, that put the border and the border security issue as part of this package. This is not a Republican issue. He brought it to the front, and that's why we're dealing with and, it. And just very quickly, I mean, you were the first person to call attention to Russia, what you described our number one geopolitical foe. Are you comfortable with your party's position on Ukraine? Well, each individual makes their own uh, posture known on, on a particular issue. My own view is that it's very much in America's interest to see Ukraine successful and to provide uh, the, the weapons that Ukraine needs to, to defend itself. Anything other than that would be a huge dereliction of our responsibility, I believe, to the world of democracy, but also to our own national interest. Because mm -hmm. if Putin thinks he can invade his neighbor with impunity, and that we're just going to step by, back, that we're going to say, oh, we're tired, we're not going to keep on helping, then guess what? He's not going to stop. And he's going to go into a NATO nation that's going to draw NATO and our troops into war with Russia. This is in America's interest to make sure that Ukraine puts up a great fight. Senator Romney, thank you. Stay with us. We have a lot more after the break, including will Senator Romney endorse a candidate in the 2024 race? Plus, Three top university presidents are under fire for their responses to a congressional hearing on anti-Semitism. More with Senator Romney after the break. Welcome back. University of Pennsylvania President Liz McGill resigned on Saturday after facing intense criticism from alumni, lawmakers, and the White House for dodging a question at a congressional hearing about anti-Semitism on campus. In a five-hour House hearing on Tuesday, McGill and her counterparts at Harvard and MIT evaded questions about whether students should be disciplined if they call for genocide of Jews. I am asking, specifically calling for the genocide of Jews, does that constitute bullying or harassment? If it is directed and severe or pervasive, it is harassment. So the answer is yes. It is a context-dependent decision, Congresswoman. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard Code of Conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. And Senator Mitt Romney is still here with us. Senator. Let me just get your reaction to what we just witnessed. Again, the president of the University of Pennsylvania has now resigned. Should the other two presidents resign? Well, I'm not going to tell them what they should do, but what they did in that hearing was absolutely repugnant, was outrageous, incomprehensible. Uh, it, it, it violates the very premises of, of, of American unity. We're a diverse nation, not to recognize that calling for the genocide of a people is, is awful, is hate crime. I mean, th th this was uh, an extraordinary breach on the part of the, uh, the judgment of the heads of these universities. And people are saying, wait, wait a second. If a conservative speaker wanted to come, stop, come to their campus, oh, they'd be all outraged. No, they can't come there. But they're saying it's okay for people to call for genocide of the Jewish people. 
And, and by the way, this is not just about Jews. It's about uh, members of Islam. I mean, it, it's about tolerance for people who are different in our country. And these university presidents have to stand up for that. Their failure to do so was an extraordinary failure. Well, you take me to my next question, Senator, because you're right. It's about anti-Semitism, yet it's about Islamophobia. It's about hate in all of its forms. Does Congress have a role to play in addressing the issue of hate on college campuses? Should Congress be more engaged in what's happening? Yeah, not by creating law, mm -hmm. but by creating example. And, and recognize that the people we choose as our leaders are not just going to write law and effectuate policy. They're also setting the character of the country. It's one of the reasons I have such concern about President Trump, which is he has affected the character of America. Look, we are a diverse nation. Whether people want it to be that way or not, we are highly diverse not just by ethnicity, but also by religion, by, by sexual orientation. I mean, there are a whole series of dimensions in which we're diverse. That's who we are. You may not like it. That's who we are. And the only way a nation as diverse as us is able to be strong is if we recognize the, um, the divine nature of humanity, we recognize one another, their faults, and we don't attack each other. Tearing down other Americans, retribution, revenge, anger, that is not the future of a great country. Let's turn now to the 2024 race as you bring up former President Trump. Why haven't you endorsed a candidate yet, Senator, and do you plan to do so? Well, because if I endorse someone, it would be the kiss of death. No, I'm not going to do that. Maybe I should, I should pick, shall I, shall I endorse the person I, I like least right now? <laughs> Look, I, I'm not going to be uh, endorsing President Trump, obviously. I've made that very clear. Um, look, Chris Christie has done a terrific job so far. I think uh, his being in the race has kept Donald Trump from coming to the, to the debates. Because I think Donald Trump recognized if he went to the debate with Chris Christie, Chris Christie would reveal him for what he was. And, and Trump would be badly hurt, so he stayed out. But Nikki Haley, she's rising. Right now, I think she's the only one that has a shot at becoming the nominee, other than President Trump. It's a long shot in her part, but she's the one that has a shot. So we'll see. Do you think it's time for other candidates, not Nikki Haley, since you think she has the momentum right now, to drop out of the race, to start consolidating their support, given what you're saying? Yeah, I don't think it's my role to tell other people when they should get out. It's too big of a sacrifice and investment by people and their supporters. Uh, to be uh, it, running for president, for someone to come in and say, hey, you ought to get out. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but I hope it continues to consolidate and it becomes at some point a two-person race. But even then, I think Donald Trump is a prohibitive favorite. Let me ask you a little bit more about what Liz Cheney said. She said the country would be better run by Democrats than by Donald Trump and MAGA Republicans. That's not an exact quote, but that's effectively what she has said. Do you agree with her there? Well, President Biden's policies have not worked for America. Uh, you know, I know that the, the economic statistics are looking better right now, but the American people are hurting. As they go into the grocery store and bread costs $5 a loaf, they recognize that that's the result of Biden's policies. So I'm not going to say Biden's policies are good for America. Uh, there's some Democrats out there that I think would do a better job. I hope someone besides President Biden is the nominee of the Democrat Party. We'd see who that might be. Well, you wrote your wife's name in for president in 2016 and 2020. If there is, in fact, a Biden and Trump rematch, would you vote for President Biden, given what you are saying about former President Trump? Well, the Joe I would like to vote for is Joe Manchin. Uh, and I'm not going to tell you right now who I'm going to vote for. Fortunately, I'm, for me, I'm in a state that... Uh, uh, that's not a swing state. It's not a state in contest. Whoever I vote for in Utah, uh, Utah is going to be for Donald Trump. So it's kind of irrelevant. But I, I typically vote for, for Ann for that reason. Do you think that Senator Manchin's going to run? No, I don't. But I wish he would. You're going to encourage I wish, him I too? wish he'd be the Democratic nominee. And by the way, there, there are other, a couple of Democrats I might think of that, that would be a better nominee, I think, than President Biden. Just to put a fine point on it, though, it sounds like you're not ruling out voting for President Biden. I, I'm not going to describe who I'll rule out other than President Trump. I just, you, you know, you, you have a setting where you have someone who's, uh, who's too old uh, and someone else who's a little too nutty. And uh, where are you going to vote in, uh, on that basis? And, and by the way, in my, in my view, uh, bad policy we can overcome as a country. Yeah. We have in the past. Yeah. Bad character is something which is very difficult to, to, to overcome. Well, let me ask you, if Donald Trump is the Republican nominee but loses to President Biden, do you think the certification process will be peaceful or are you concerned that it may not be? 
Oh, I think it'll be peaceful. Um, I don't think there's any question but that Vice President Kamala Harris will not uh, try and reject electors from uh, uh, states that are certifying President Biden as one. Uh, I, I, I just don't think America is going to erupt, uh, but, uh, but I know there'll be some, uh, some people who hope it, that would occur. Well, let's talk about you and your future, your decision to leave the Senate. You've been adamant you're not going to run for president, so I won't ask you that question. But what is next for you, Senator? Well, I came here to ask you whether perhaps a position here at NBC News would be available <laughs> for me. No, I don't have the answer to that. You know, I, I, will, I will continue to work to keep America the hope of the earth and the hope of the people in this country. And whether that's by lecturing in universities or going around the country and speaking or writing another book or two, uh, or maybe just, you know, getting behind some of Anne's ambitions these days. And my, my wife is leading an extraordinary center for neurologic research. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, life is so fantastic. It's so wonderful being alive. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't worry about my next chapter. All right. Well, I have to ask you about your dad, George Romney, who was, of course, the governor of Michigan. He also ran for president. You have called him your life's hero, what would he think about the state of the Republican Party today? Oh, he would not understand it. He would not believe it. The party is very different than it was. Look, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm reading a lot of history. I'm reading a, a book right now called The Age of Acrimony. It talks about the uh, American politics in the 1800s and the early 1900s. Holy cow, the parties were so different back then. When I ran in 2012, the party is different than it is today. Mm -hmm. President Trump became our nominee. We got all sorts of new people who'd been Democrats forever that flowed into the Republican Party, and a lot of people left. And, and so it's a different party today than it was then. Um, I, I think he'd be surprised to see how much it's changed. Uh, and I think the social and cultural division that you're seeing today would be of concern to him. But don't forget, when he was a governor, we had race riots, even mm -hmm. his home state of Michigan and Detroit. So uh, you know, we're, we're wrestling with some of these divisive issues even today. All right, Senator Mitt Romney, you are welcome back anytime. Thank you so much for being here. Really Thanks, appreciate Krista. it. When we come back, Republicans are demanding changes to border security before agreeing to send military aid to Ukraine and Israel. Is a deal within reach? Democratic Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, the lead negotiator, joins me next. Welcome back. A bipartisan group of senators restarted border talks on Thursday, offering dim hope that Congress can pass a broad legislative package that would include aid for Israel and Ukraine before the end of the year. The president signaled he is ready to compromise. Would you be okay with Democrats willing to uh, put more on border policy to get this current package through? Yes, significantly more particularly by starting off equipping the border capacity that we need on the border, from judges to more border security. And Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, the lead Democratic negotiator in those talks, joins me now. Welcome back to Meet the Press, Senator. Thanks for having me back. Thank you so much for being here. So bring us up to speed. What's the very latest on the negotiations? Where do things stand? So uh, first, I think it's absolutely tragic that Republicans are tying the resolution of maybe the most difficult issue in American politics, immigration, um, to support for Ukraine and Israel. Vladimir Putin is delighting right now in Republicans' insistence that we get a deal on immigration reform. And if we don't, then they are going to allow Vladimir Putin to march into Ukraine and perhaps into Europe. I think this is one of the most dangerous moments that I've ever faced in American politics, and I wish Republicans weren't holding Israel aid and aid to Ukraine hostage to the resolution of immigration reform. That being said, we are still in the room trying to deal with Republicans de with Republican demands. Um, we are not going to put Donald Trump's immigration policies into statute. We're not going to do that. That would be bad for the country. Uh, but we do need to do something to try to resolve uh, this crisis at the border. We have too many people crossing, too many people that don't have valid asylum claims. And if Republicans are serious about trying to um, control that crisis while also still allowing into the country people who are legitimately fleeing terror and torture and violence, then we can come to a resolution. I want to delve into some of the details with you, but give us a gut check. How close are you to a deal? Is this going to get done before the new year, Senator? I mean, right now, Republican demands are unreasonable. They don't actually get Democratic votes. Uh, if I were a cynic, 
I would say that Republicans have decided to tie support for Ukraine to immigration reform because they want Ukraine aid to fail. But I'm not a cynic. And so um, we are still trying to resolve some pretty big differences that remain. You don't sound very optimistic that this is going to get done with the handful of days that you have left. Uh, we are coming up uh, against the end of the year. And, of course, this is a crisis moment for Ukraine. Um, uh, Ukraine is running out of ammunition. And if we don't solve this in the next few weeks, Vladimir Putin is going to have an opening, an opening to march through the Ukrainian lines to make a move on Kiev, threatening all of Europe. So this has to be resolved right now, which is why Republicans have to be reasonable. We are not going to solve the entire problem of immigration between now and the end of the year, but we can make a down payment. We know that based on our reporting, the White House is going to get more engaged. Should the president himself get involved in these negotiations this week? I, I think the White House is going to get more engaged this week. Of course, when you're talking about something as complicated as border security, you need the White House engaged mm -hmm. because you need to know whether they're going to sign the bill and you need to understand how the changes you're making are going to be implemented at the border. So they are and they will get more engaged. Let's talk about some of the sticking points. I know you're not going to negotiate with me here, but if you could give me a sense of where potential common ground could be. We know that Republicans are asking to toughen the asylum criteria. We know that they want new restrictions on the use of parole. Are those potential areas of compromise for Democrats? I think the bottom line for Democrats and the bottom line for my constituents um, is pretty simple. Um, we don't want to shut off the United States of America to people who are coming here to be rescued from dangerous, miserable circumstances in which their life is in jeopardy. That's the, the best of America, is that you can come here to be rescued from terror and torture. Um, so we are not going to support anything that shuts down the border completely to people who are legitimately coming here to have their lives rescued. But we are willing to talk about tightening some of the rules so that you don't have 10,000 people arriving a day. We, our resources are not equipped to be able to handle that number of people. So let's reduce the number of people who are coming here, but let's not shut down the water completely to legitimate claims. Well, and Republicans would argue, many of them, they're not calling to completely shut down the border, but as you say, to make it tougher to get through. If you look at the poll numbers, the latest Wall Street Journal poll shows a whopping 64% of people disapprove of President Biden's handling of the border. Does that add pressure on you, on Democrats, to get something done here? Well, listen, I, I'm not paying attention to the politics here. What I know is that the future of the world is at stake. If we fail, if Republicans don't get reasonable in the next 24 to 48 hours, um, Russia is going to march into Ukraine. China is going to be given a green light to invade Taiwan. The world for my children is fundamentally different under that scenario. The United States security is at risk. So I, I am just beside myself that Republicans are playing games with the security of the world. I will try to meet them where they are, but this is a very dangerous uh, point. I want to ask you about Ukraine aid. You are giving these dire warnings here. We have consistently heard you say that. Can an extra $60 billion in aid change the outcome of this war, or will it just allow Ukraine to continue with the status quo? It can change the outcome of this war, because at the very same time that we are making a renewed commitment to Ukraine, Russia's ability to continue to fight this war is in jeopardy. You look at the um, revenues from oil sales, the projections for the next year, um, Russia is going to have a hard time coming up with the resources necessary to keep this fight going. In the end, will there likely have to be a negotiated solution? Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, if we cut off Ukraine now, the outcome is certain. The outcome is certain. Ukraine loses this war. Maybe n not next month, um, but sometime next year, because Europe will not stick with us if the United States aband abandons Ukraine. This is a decision moment for Ukraine, for the United States and the world. I do want to ask you about some of the other headlines this week. Hunter Biden has been indicted again on tax charges do you think the Hunter Biden prosecution is political, as his lawyer has contended, or do you think that it's legally justified? I think it's legally justified. I think this is a very troubled 
individual who has uh, who, who has uh, done things that are worthy of prosecution. And so I look forward to that case continuing. I think ultimately the American people understand that Hunter Biden is not going to be on the ballot next uh, fall, that Joe Biden is going to be on the ballot, and that this is a president who has led an economic recovery that has been pretty unprecedented. That's, I think, going to be what matters to the American people. Senator Mitt Romney was here and he expressed outrage over the broader issue of Hunter Biden profiting off of his last name. Do you think, Senator, that it is inappropriate for a politician's family member to profit off of their last name? I do, um, in any case. Uh, and frankly, when I look at the, the Trump family, it, it seems that they have made an industry uh, out of profiting off of Donald Trump's presidency. In fact, as soon as Donald Trump was out of the White House, what did his son-in-law do? Go and raise billions of dollars from Saudi Arabia. Um, and so I, I think the American public are, are going to be very concerned about what has happened inside the Trump family since Donald Trump but left the White House. Senator, respectfully, I asked you about the Biden family. Hunter Biden, do you think it's inappropriate that he has apparently profited off his, his last name? And could that hurt the president's reelection chances? I, I think Hunter Biden is going to be held accountable in court for any violations of the law that he's committed. And the American public are going to get the chance to watch that play out in real time. But what I'm absolutely certain of is that the American public are going to see a distinct contrast between Joe Biden and Donald Trump and are not going to be interested in a Trump presidency that's going to criminalize abortion, that's going to give more handouts to billionaires and the wealthy. They're going to see uh, President Biden, who has invested in the middle class, who has helped this economy recover. That will be the contrast that will matter to the American people. Senator Chris Murphy, thank you so much. Thanks for being here in person. Thank you. Really appreciate it. When we come back, will Iowa voters look beyond Trump as their party nominee? What history tells us about how important winning Iowa really is for a presidential campaign? Welcome back. We're now just five weeks away from the Iowa caucuses and the very first votes of the 2024 presidential cycle. Historically, Iowa hasn't been a great predictor of Republican nominees. Ted Cruz, Rick Santorum and Mike Huckabee all won the state. None of them became their party's nominee. In 1988, Kansas Senator Bob Dole also won Iowa. The eventual nominee, George H.W. Bush, finished a distant third. Senator Dole joined this broadcast the day before the caucuses. Can you afford to lose here? Are you finished if you don't finish first? <laughs> well, I don't One. think I'm finished, but uh, I'd like to will do you, well here. Will you uh, have but to I, haven't, I haven't moved since 1980, and I ran in 1980, and that wasn't the, the neighborhood that made me finish last. I think it's the fact that I've been dealing with the issues since that time. I have a message to the Iowa voters, and what we want is a signal to go out here tomorrow night that the Bob Dole message uh, was uh, accepted by a majority of people and went to the Republican caucus. A majority of the people. You're looking for 50 percent? Well, are I you? mean, a plurality, excuse me, okay. a little oversight. Can you survive a loss here? Oh, yes. Uh, a loss is a loss, a win is a win. Well, that's certainly <laughs> and very profound. Yes, yes, it is. Gertrude yes. Stein would have loved <laughs> it. <laughs> A loss is a loss and a win is a win. Good stuff there. All right, when we come back, what's the political impact for President Biden as his son faces a new set of criminal charges? The panel is next. Welcome back. The panel is here. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell, Jonathan Martin, senior political columnist for Politico, Democratic pollster Cornell Belcher and Lonnie Chen, a fellow at the Hoover Institution and former Romney campaign policy director. Thanks to all of you for being here. Kelly, let me start with you. There's this new Wall Street Journal poll which shows that former President Trump is leading President Biden by four points. Take us inside Biden world. How concerning is this? And I know within this context, you've got new reporting on how they might use the issue of abortion, which we've obviously been talking about here in 2024. The first reaction is that bad poll numbers are something that is somewhat baked in in the minds of people who are close to the president. They've seen it before. And then they turn quickly and look at recent elections and say, when voters are asked to not just respond to a survey, but to cast a ballot, they have done so in ways that match up with some of the president's priorities. We saw it in November in Virginia with mm -hmm. the state legislature. We saw it in Ohio with respect to abortion. On abortion, uh, the new reporting is that the campaign will more aggressively tie Donald Trump 
to every instance mm. in America where there is a restriction, a ban on abortion, when there is abortion in the news. You were talking with Senator Romney about the Texas case to say Ken Paxton, the state attorney general there, was endorsed by Donald Trump. Mm. And so they want to link Trump in every way to the change in people's lives with respect to abortion. And to then say that is the kind of position you would have. When when Donald Trump talks about day one yeah. uh, being an authoritarian, a dictator, they're saying day by day mm. he's becoming more autocratic. And so if they look at something practical like abortion, that's a way to get at it. Democracy might be more theoretical for many Americans. And so abortion is a way where they can link him to that day by day. Fascinating. Jonathan, you heard Mitt Romney, a couple of things that stood out to mm -hmm. me. One, he did not rule out voting for President Biden. Yes. Number two, he said he'd like to see Joe Manchin run. Yes. Is that realistic? I mean, we've been trying to get no. an answer out of Joe Manchin. <laughs> uh, I don't think Joe Manchin is running for president. And I think uh, Mitt Romney is going to have a choice next fall that he's not thrilled about. But I think ultimately he will come down on the side of picking President Biden. It's a matter of how public he is about that and whether or not he tries to avoid the question a few more times between now and then. But that's the option. And by the way, not just Mitt Romney. I think a lot mm. of what I would call kind of the pre-Trump GOP figures in this country, George W. Bush, Liz Cheney, they're not thrilled about Joe Biden. But that's going to be the option they have. And I think they're going to be challenged next year, especially if President Trump keeps talking in the sort of autocratic fashion of you don't like Biden's policies, but do you really want this as the alternative, which is why you see so many people like Romney say, maybe there'll be a different Democrat. Maybe somebody else mm. will emerge I can vote for because they're desperate to not have that Biden-Trump option. But that increasingly seems like that is where we're going right now. And so I think that they're going to have to pick. It sure does. Lonnie Chen, you were the policy director for Mitt Romney when he was running for president. A lot of people want to compare this moment, a lot of Democrats, to 2012. They say, hey, remember when former President, Ob <laughs> former president Biden, or Obama, I should say, was locked in a fierce fight with Governor Romney, but is it the same as 2012? I don't think so. I mean, I went back and looked at the numbers as an example. In 2012, at this point, uh, in that campaign, Barack Obama either had a narrow lead or in some cases he has as much as an eight-point lead uh, in a head-to-head -head against Mitt Romney. The challenge in this election is really twofold for the president. I think, first of all, uh, the issues on which he's weakest, the economy and immigration in that Wall Street Journal poll, happen to be the issues that Americans care most about if you believe that poll. The other challenge he has is that, look, and I think this applies to Donald Trump as well, they are both equally disliked, to Jonathan's right. point. Mm -hmm. If you look at their very unfavorable ratings, these ratings of great intensity, sort of saying, who do you really like, who do you really dislike, Donald Trump and Joe Biden are equally disliked with an equal amount of fervor, 50%. It's a remarkable yeah. number. This is the election no American wants. It's yeah. not just the elites. Americans don't want this election. It, it is extraordinary. Well, well look, yeah. I, I, I think there are some differences. There's some huge differences between now and 2012. Uh, but I will say this. In the public polling, no, actually, uh, Mitt Romney was ahead of Barack Obama. And in the public polling, internal polling, it was different. But let me say this about, about, about the polling. Enough with all the polling, mm. right? It's not predictive of, of what's going to happen in the, in the presidential election. Even though there are a number and, of polls and, pointing to the listen, same thing? Listen, this is, this is why we use polling in, in campaigns. This is what we use for polling for a campaign. We use polling to see what the problem is and how you build a campaign to fix the problem. When I see that 47, 43 number, I'm not at all concerned mm. about, about what's going to happen in the future. By the way, I'm actually emboldened because I know, quite frankly, where Donald Trump's going to be. He gets 47, 46 percent. He, he wins by subtraction, not, a, not addition. Now, underneath that poll, what you have there is what I call the Obama continuum, right? These, these younger voters who are not necessarily st strongly tied to either Democrat or Republican, although they're, they're a lot more progressive on, on, on most issues. And that's where Biden right now is suffering the most. And these are not going to ever be Trump voters. So the yeah. campaign they're going to have to build work is one to, to, is work to bring those young voters back. John, but the risk is that they don't vote at all or even more, that ominous, is a risk. Or mm. more, more ominously for Biden. You have 10,000 voters or more in Madison, Wisconsin, Ann Arbor, Michigan, who pull a lever for Jill Stein or Cornell West. That is devastating to Biden's coalition. That's 2016 all over again. That, see, I'm more worried about their third party yeah. voting yeah. than I'm worried about Trump doing it. And the campaign Trump tells Trump me voted. that they are aware of that. And so they don't believe that with black and brown voters and young voters, they can just do traditional get out the vote. Yeah. They have to do persuasion, yes. active persuasion to remind voters about things like the Trump 
trouble spots you mentioned, yeah. economic issues. And but, but is also, the, go ahead. Really quickly, but also, look, I, I, I came out of the field with a poll two weeks ago. And this, this is what actually helps him, right? It's the comparison to, to Trump. When I ask African-American voters, talking about African-American voters, uh, a closed-in list of what's the, the greatest threats to the African-American community, inflation, crime, the re-election of Donald Trump. Mm. The re-election of Donald Trump by a plurality of African-American th- voters think that that's the greatest threat to the African-American community. Mm. Not inflation, not crime, but Donald Trump. Well, we got that's a new, motivator. That's a motivator. We got a new data point in the race, of course, this week, which is that the son of President Biden has been indicted yet again and that Republicans are moving to open an impeachment inquiry into President Biden despite there not being a link yet. Here's what he had to say about that inquiry this week. Can you explain to the Americans... Uh, to Americans admit this impeachment inquiry, why you interacted with so many of your son and brother's foreign business associates? I'm not going to comment that I did not, and it's just a bunch of lies. You didn't interact with many uh, of these, their lies. business associates? I did not. There's oh. lies. Kelly fired up there. We should note those comments were made before Hunter Biden was indicted. What is the strategy to deal with this inside the White House? It's painful. It's personal. They want to put it in that category. Mm -hmm. They also say that in 2020, Hunter Biden was a a fixture of the Republican campaign. And I think they want to talk about voters able to separate the candidate's son from the candidate. And they think Republicans are trying to use this to diffuse the legal troubles of Donald Trump. Find me the Biden White House advisor who's going to go to the boss and say, we need a new strategy about your son there who's, right, well, uh, who's been indicted. They're they not going to have that conversation with him. Money's the waters. That's the challenge that they have. Of course. Is that, that this is an issue on which they could potentially prosecute Donald Trump. They're going to have to turn this into a referendum on Donald Trump. Yes. And if they're going to use the issue which they want to use, mm. which is the character of Donald Trump, this muddies the waters for the White House. And that's the challenge here is really how do they overcome this? And someone has to speak truth to power I, on this. I just think someone I, has to make that I just, point. I just think what, what your child does, as, as most parents understand, that's not muddy my waters, right? That what, you know, if your child gets in trouble, that that's not muddy my waters. Here's the other thing. Look, don't take it from me. Take it from Chip Roy, right? Republican. What is the House, what, what is, have House Republicans done that they can run on? Right. Last time I checked, I, I've been in focus groups for the last two months. No middle American working mom is bringing up Hunter Biden. She's bringing up costs. She's bringing up student and loans. Yet, she's not talking about Hunter Biden. And, this is and, the issue they want yet, to go re- into. And yet to Republicans are, are winning on the generic ballot. And yet it's yeah. the case that Republicans are always at this time winning on the generic ballot. Because of the image right. of what he says. It's not just what he says. It's how he looks in the presentation well, right. that is jarring yeah. Americans. All right, folks, we have to leave it there. This was fantastic. <laughs> you don't need me here. At all. Thank you. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. Happy Hanukkah. We'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.